Next, we have the release of the book titled Another Marx. This book has been authored by Dr. Marcelo Musto. Can we please have you on stage? I also request our chief guest, Lord Meghna Desai, to please come on stage. This book will be discussed by Dr. Michael Bree and Professor Kohei Saito. Can I please invite our discussants on stage? We are only launching one book, not all your books. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. No, 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 Okay, so you two are going to comment yes, on this book? Very good. It's cool, they're here. Well, I've, I have already read the first 80 pages. <laughs> you have been reading I've, I've been just sitting there reading this book. I've not been paying any attention. Okay, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, it's, really, it's really a great, uh, uh, great pleasure and joy to uh, launch this book by... Professor Marcelo Munto, Musto, uh, it's called Another Marx. No, it is not a revisionist book. Uh, it is just another book on Marx. And so the short title is Another Marx. And I think it's very good. I think I'll first ask, uh, shall I ask you to? Them, 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 them. I'll ask them. OK, why don't you go first? I go first, OK. You, you go first. Okay, so I go first and quick because we are already tired. But this is a great book, so let me explain why this is a great book. So, Professor Musto has uh, published this biography on Marx for the 200th birthday of the Karl Marx. And uh, I'm here because I'm also preparing a Japanese translation of this book, Another Marks, coming out probably in October or November. And uh, Korean edition has already appeared, so it's already disseminating all over the world. And still, some people may wonder, why do we need another biography? Why yet another biography of Marx? Because, you know, as we all know, there are so many Marx biographies in the past. Like the famous one is from Ma Franz Mehling and then August Colnu or Francis Wien, and then we can also name other ones from Carr and so on. But especially in the last few years, there are even more. And uh, the famous one is by Jonathan Spada. Uh, also, the Stedman John published the one from Harvard University Press. And as yesterday, uh, Bree mentioned, uh, Michael Heinle has just uh, published another one in May 2018. And yes, also, Paula mentioned this book from Sweden, the Sven Erik Liedman uh, published also a very thick uh, biography on Marx. So, why do we need? Another one, even if Musto is a very clever guy, you know, why do we need another one? So I have three points why we need a new biography by Musto. The first one is the revival of Marx theory today. Uh, the Marx revival is expression taken from the introduction of the book. And uh, this is a very strong point in contrast to other recent biographies by Spava and Stedman Jones, for example, uh, because they clearly regard Marx as a thinker of the 19th century, not a contemporary thinker. So Marx theory has basically no theoretical relevance today anymore. It's not valid. We can read Marx as a historical figure, but we cannot really learn anything. <coughs> so that's very boring, I think. And then when you read Musto's book, he really emphasizes why Marx is important again today for anyone who wants to criticize capitalism. He says, for example, in reality, Marx's analysis are more topical today than they have ever been. 
or he also says those who today want to use essential theoretical concepts for the critique of the capitalist mode of production still cannot dispense with reading Marx Capital. So he really tries to understand today's uh, economic and democratic crisis uh, through Marx, and then this is a very important point uh, in contrast to other academic historians writing biographies of Marx. And the second point, I don't have much time, so I go quick. Uh, the second point is the new materials published in the Mega, the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe. Uh, these were, these uh, contained manuscripts on, for capital, but letters from Marx and Engels, or to Marx and Engels, and there are also excerpts, notebooks, uh, that were unavailable to the earlier biographers. So those biographers made mistakes, the wrong assumptions, and so on and so on, but uh, based on the newest materials, uh, Professor Musto showed a more accurate ac account of the life and the theoretical development of Karl Marx. And one prominent example is economic and philosophical manuscripts. People usually think this is manuscripts, but this is not. And uh, many people like Jürgen Loyan and Musto argue that uh, this text emerged rather spontaneous fashion. Marx didn't have any plan to write a manuscript at the time, to write any book at the time. He was studying uh, Adam Smith and those people in the Paris, and then uh, in the process of making notes, uh, he sort of diverged from taking notes and then started writing comments, and that became a big uh, chunk of text, uh, which we regard as wrongly as uh, manuscripts. So uh, these kind of things that uh, you can only learn by reading the mega. So I think this is a second important point. And the third important point is the last Marx. Uh, so most of the biographies do not really deal with Marx after 1868 because there are not many letters and Marx didn't really publish anything after uh, 1868. So people don't really spend uh, much uh, chapters on the late Marx, but Musto traces here the very carefully Marx's life until his last journey to Algeria, but more importantly, Marx made many theoretical developments in the, his last years in terms of non-Western societies or ecology and gender, and these are new things that are also revealed through the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, and uh, Musto really carefully follows these, uh, the latest uh, stage of Marx's theoretical life. So I think these three points, the, mm, the <laughs> revival of Marx and the mega and the la last Marx are the three important points of Marx's uh, biography by Marcelo Musto. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much and good evening. Um, Corey already spoke about two books, yeah, the late Marx and another Marx. Uh, the first book, the late Marx, was just uh, translated by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation into German and will be published on July the 1st. I was thus today informed. And now I, we got your other book, another Marx. And um, why it's another Marx? Um, I think as... Um, Professor Desai already said it's maybe another book on the another Marx because I think there are a lot of books now uh, able to uh, present Marx in a new way because we are maybe on the one hand much more open because we do not have any more the Soviet uh, problem dealing with Marx and also of course we have a lot of new material and Marx. Let me spend two or three minutes for appraisal of the book. Also the easiest way, of course, just look on the book, on the cover of the book, and you will find Wallerstein, Bob Jessop, John Bellamy Forster saying, this book stands out, it's essential to all of us, indispensable guide, excellent place to start, and so on. So you have already a lot of uh, advertisement <laughs> for this book. Um, but I would like to praise your book in my own words. And firstly, I like really the ongoing curiosity which you are traveling forth and back through the world of Karl Marx. Also the late Marx, I think very, very important, making it clear he did not die before he was dead. 
Um, uh, Marx was one of the most open thinkers at, of his times, and you are really able to present him like this. And um, of course, because now more and more of his notebooks are already mm. also available to us, and uh, so we see how much he has read and how much he was dealing with a lot of problems. Secondly, uh, I think all the time uh, we should not divide uh, Marx into very different uh, parts. The philosopher, the economist, the journalist, whatever, the politician. You are proving that he was really one person combining all these very different um, ways of um, acting on the public life. And um, this is, and how he all the time nevertheless tried to transform this into weapons, into weapons for his struggles. This is, so thirdly, I think very important, your book makes it clear how much Marx's whole work was driven by strictly political aims. Uh, um, uh, to realize this is helping to reflect, I think, also our own work, and we should maybe understand that great intellectual achievements in social sciences are very often due to strong moral social commitment with a scientific furore not less strong. But both should be combined. And firstly, just your, and finally for the praise, it's just a very, very readable book. My congratulations, often we have books which are not very readable. Yours is readable, it's close to a thriller. Okay, this was a praise. I, uh, to prove that I was not bribed by Marcello, I want to stress <laughs> just one problem. Um, uh, in your description of the first international, it becomes clear that Marx's position was just one in a very broad socialist workers movement of his time. I think this is important. And this movement was marked by deep contradictions and this is of course true for the whole different periods of Marx's uh, work. And there is Marx as a revolutionary intellectual able to support the combination of contradictory forces but there is also Marx as a revolutionary using his intellectual power to split forces which should work together to destroy, as you are writing rightly, his uh, enemies, his false brothers, as he called Proudhon. And as far as we are again part and parcel of movements marked by deep contradictions, I think it would be helpful to prove this, that uh, we should learn how, also by the weak strengths and weaknesses of Marx, how to deal with these contradictions. What I want to make clear for me is uh, Marx, all strong thinkers have with their strengths also a weak side. It's the, op it's the other side of the coin. And um, uh, I think we should look also more precisely when we are discussing, describing Marx, we, are looking, we should look on his, his adversaries because um, why not to ask what was lost when Marx broke with Hegel? I think there was lost a lot. <laughs> Why not to bring in John Stuart Mill? He lived at the same time at London like Marx. Yeah? Bring in John Stuart Mill, strong critique of a radical full-scale state socialist experiment. Why not to bring in Proudhon's and, Ma and Bakunin's criticism of state socialism yeah. and the very weak answer of Marx to it? Okay, I can. So what I think it's important. Another Marx would mean for me more also to put him into a real um, dialogue. I want to close with one remark. If we are going and buy a medicine, we are warned normally. There is a paper in the, with the medicine. Yeah? Please note that the medicine may have unwelcomed, unwelcomed side effects. Yeah? <laughs> Be careful. And I would have loved to find in your book a chapter at the end with such wise advice for those who start to read the works of Marx. Because <laughs> there was a lot of misreading of Marx and mislead, with misleading effects. Um, there is a very um, uh, important German communist uh, writer, um, 
Bertolt Brecht. He said, uh, he wrote a poem about the praise of the doubt. And you know, for Marx, <laughs> doubt was the most important maxim for him. Yeah? Mm. This was his leading idea, and we should take it uh, seriously. Bertolt Brecht wrote, praise the doubt. I advise you to greet cheerfully and will respect those who test your word like a bad penny. I wish you'd be wise and give your word not too confident. I think we should work also with this, with this regard um, um, to reading Marx in you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let, uh, let me say before I pass uh, the mic on to uh, Marcelo, uh, I have been reading this book while sitting there, as some people may have noticed, uh, very rudely while listening to people. Uh, and I've already read 80 pages uh, with, with an afternoon. So it's a very readable book. Uh, it's also an interesting way of uh, writing a biography of Marx because it is a biography written through what he was doing, writing document, you know, reading books, summarizing books, and so on. And while, while you know, most of us know this, what is fascinating is how how slow and time-consuming this process is, even if you are Karl Marx. I mean, you know, reading, reading in 50 books to, to write one chapter is a very expensive way of writing. But that was his training. His training was as a philosopher or as a lawyer, and all you had to do was read and read and read, uh, and, and then kind of absorb I mean, the number of projects he had in mind of summarizing or writing a three volume on this and three volume on that. It's quite astonishing. He wrote very little. But also, what very dramatically, I think, what the book brings out is <clears throat> how hard up he was uh, as a person in terms of uh, money. Seriously, seriously deprived of money. And while Engels helped him out, it took a long time before Engels really took him out of his uh, of his uh, daily misery, and because Engels retired himself, and then he had a lot of money uh, to, to, to give uh, to Marx. Uh, I should also say, that throughout all this, there is this great angelic Engels, uh, who is absolutely amazing. Uh, he comes to economics first before Marx comes, and he, he outlasts Marx to publish uh, vol volume two, two and three and, and various other things. And I think somebody ought to also write an accompanying uh, a biography of Marx and Engels together, because I think this is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a marriage made in heaven. Uh, and and it, it, uh, it had, it, it spawned a lot of children uh, a, across the countries and across generations and across centuries. So I think one ought to consider Marx and Engels as a, as a biographical subject together. Anyway, up to you. That's for your next three or four books. Um, thanks uh, to the three comments, because the last one was also very um, interesting and useful uh, comments. Can you, you hear him? Uh, I, I will be, yes. I will just start uh, okay. slowly. They have been so good that I don't have to say um, very much. Also, the organizer here put me in this very complicated position every evening that if we are late for dinner, it is my fault. <laughs> like yesterday, I was moderating the chair the panel and tonight it's my final thing so i will try to be short um, i wanted to start from many of the things that koei told us about the other biographies so i don't have to say a lot but it's important to stress the fact that many biographies of marx have been very unbalanced now when the writer is franz mering who wrote the biography in 1918 is one thing, because at the time there was really a, a, a lacking of many materials. We didn't know. Um, mm. But if the last biographers of Marx still decided to dedicate only 30 pages out of 700, out of 500, on the last decade of Marx, 
then it's their fault. They are guilty. They are lazy. You should not buy their books or you should buy <laughs> them and criticize. Because now we have a lot of materials, exactly. not only thanks to the mega, but also translated in other languages. One of these, for example, are the mathematical manuscript, one of the passion of Marx. There is a fantastic new edition just printed out um, in the Indian market. Uh, I also wanted to say that my book is another failure in my uh, life of research of Marx, because it's very nice to criticize biographies written by others, <laughs> but then when you write your own biography, you have to face two problems. First one, publishing houses hate books that are more than 300 pages. So they already make the, the work very difficult because it's very um, unusual today that you can publish more than this. And second, Marx is really a beast that is always hungry of learning more, of expanding his knowledge, as it has been said, of opening his uh, ideas and uh, elaboration to new disciplines, to new languages. So it is really a very complicated task, not only to be Marx and to write this chapter by reading 50 books, but also to be a biographer of Marx, who have to sometimes summarize in one page that chapter and those 50 books. And I remember one of the best scholars of Marx, in my opinion, Maximilien Rubel, that he said that in order to be a, a, a scholar of Marx, you have to be a very good economist, a very good historian, a very good political theorist, and I would say in many other disciplines, but Michael told us Marx as a totality, and I would say you have to be also a very good doctor, because <laughs> Marx had so many diseases, unfortunately, because of his poverty, etc. that many times I called my the doctor of the trade union of CGL in Italy, and I asked him, what do you think he was having at this problem, at this moment? There is a very strong connection between Marx's life and Marx's production, in particular, but not only, in the writing of capital. Oh, so yes. it's very useful to learn what's going on to the body of Karl Marx, to the mind of Karl Marx, why he was writing capital, and also, for example, why in the end he decided to, in the end, say yes to Engels and to publish only the first book yeah. while he wanted to publish the three, four of them together with this idea of the artistic totality yeah. that he had at the time. There are also other points, and I'm going toward the conclusion. The early writings, Koe told us, Koe Saito told us that these early writings have been so overrepresented, in my opinion, in the um, secondary literature of Marx, but then not explained enough. There is a debate that is still going on, and I try to do a contribution on the uh, EPM of Paris, 1844. There are also notebooks that are not known by Marx, because I don't know if you are aware, but Marx wrote 200 notebooks during his life. He was copying the most important parts of the book that he was reading, and several times he criticized those books, he wrote his comments. It's very useful to learn this. Imagine you have been thinking about this subject, Marx and Hegel, Marx and anthropology, and then you find this very short sometimes, but very brilliant, very insightful comments made by Marx. So in this period, I um, um, studied the London notebooks, the 24 notebooks that Marx wrote between 1850 and 1853 at the beginning of this uh, encounter with the British Museum, with the library of the British Museum. And then there is the question of the International Working Men Association, which is something that I could deal in the book. Uh, in my opinion, it is very important for us to reconsider some of the debates between Marx and other socialists. For example, just one, I can because I don't have enough time. When we talk about Marx and Proudhon, and we look at the secondary literature, we see that the debate is always between the book of Proudhon published in 1846 yeah. uh, and the response of Marx published in 1847. Poverty of philosophy, philosophy yeah. of poverty. But if you really want to understand the differences of this debate, which is a political debate, as Michael Brie told us, you have to look at the fight, at the struggle, the political struggle inside the international. Because only there you can see the positions of Marx and the position of Proudhon, of the mutualist, in action with the two different options that you had. And I agree with Michael that we have to do more 
I try to uh, rediscover and retake some of the criticism of anarchism and to Bakunin, we have to do more in order to take the good sides of the opponents of Marx. And uh, we have to stop reading Marx without reading the others. Yeah. So now we have the mega, and we can finally read the correspondence of Marx, which is not only Marx and Engels, Engels and Marx, huh? uh, these two gods, but we also can finally read the letters that Marx received, the ideas of other people sure. who were contemporary to him. And the same in terms of, as Michael rightly told, uh, said, the position inside the international. Then there is the second book, the second part, because in English I decided to divide quite the uh, options. And the second part is about the last Marx. Oh, so right. the last decade, this famous last decade that many people considered as has been said, Marx dead before he died, right? I believe that this is a legend, and it's also wrong to believe that Marx was only merely focused in the conflict between capital and labor. There is much more there, and uh, um, I will dedicate this topic to my talk tomorrow, which likely for me is not at 7.38. I will be in the early afternoon, so I can tell you more. But I wanted to end with this idea of the title. You know, the title sometimes is something that you have to put in few words. I want to make clear that I don't belong to the interpretation of the unknown marks, yeah. which means the fact that every time there is a publication of a new page in the Marx Engels Gesamtos Gabe, people have a sort of drama of the discovery, and they say everything that you have read about Marx before, it's you have to put it in the garbage. <laughs> now with this new page that we found, it's something completely different. Because we know that the last set of unpublished materials of Marx, like the Grundrisse in 1953s, like the studies on ethnology and anthropology in the 70s, are uh, a kind of experience in the history of the reception of Marx that are no longer possible today because finally we know and we have all the writings, manuscripts, yeah. notebooks and letters that are still available of Marx. But still the mega, the new mega, with the complete publication of the second section, so all the draft of capital from 1857 to 1881, mm -hmm. with the publication of these so important notebooks, like the one that Koei Saito is editing with many insight ideas on ecology, with these things of the correspondence that, uh, that I told you, the letters, or, for example, with the more correct publication of books of manuscript like the German ideology and the economical philosophical manuscript, we can talk of another Marx. So not the drama of the unknown, like it was famous, made famous in the article of 1968 in the New Left Review after the publication, just before the publication of the Grundrisse, but definitely a Marx that is different from the picture that many Marxists and many anti-Marxists present in the 20th century, a Marx dogmatic, a Marx economicistic with economicistic thought, a Marx that is not interested in democracy, in individual freedom. I believe that this Marx is very faithful to what he wrote in the international, in the state of international, which is first of all politics, which means self-emancipation of the working class. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dinner. Dinner. <laughs>